the extent I have been, and right. I would continue to fight the fire the way I would. Right. But do you think it would be distracting? No. What if there were 12 people yelling at you and telling you that you were doing it wrong? I think um, a burning structure in a city where there are buildings and homes and people living on either side is much more concerning than 20 people trying to tell me to do something different. Right. But you, you wouldn't be distracted by that at all? No. What if they started calling you names? Like I said, I know my job and I, I would be confident in doing my job and there's nothing anybody could say that would distract me. Okay. So um, what if they started to physically threaten you? I'll repeat myself because I'm confident in my job and what I do and what needs to be done and my training. So I would continue to do that. What, what is staging? What does it mean when a fire department stages at an incident? They're, um, it, it's always different, but uh, we can stage to wait for someone to assess what's exactly going on and what, how we need to tackle that particular call. Okay. So let's assume there's a call and the police are on scene at the call, right? And they- Are you, sorry to interrupt. Are you talking about a medical call? We stage for different things. Sure, let's, let's leave it as a medical call. Okay. And there's some trouble at the scene. Does, do you just come right in into that emergency call or does fire stage until police clear the scene? We stage and wait for police to give code four. Right. Code Safe. four means all clear. Safe, yep. So in a situation where there is trouble mm -hmm. and the police are dealing with that trouble and they know they need a medical personnel to come into the scene, yeah. medical won't come into the scene until it is called code four, right? Correct. All right. And um, you said in your experience, you've been on numerous calls throughout the two years you've been a firefighter, right? Correct. And. Uh, what would you agree that a, a fair number of those may have been calls that started out as call where the police responded first? Correct. So it's usually the police that are there first, they do some assessment and they will call for medical. Correct. Have you ever been called to a scene where the police didn't call you? Mm -hmm. Meaning the police were present and they weren't the ones that called you. Can you repeat the question? Sure. It's a little confusing. Police go to a scene, right? And whatever's happening at the scene, and they just don't ever call for medical even though there's a medical situation. Well, I wouldn't know because that means I wasn't called to it. Precisely, right? So if you go to a scene, it's because you're responding to a call, right? Correct. And the reason that you are there is because the police call you. If the police are on the scene first. Right, if the police are on the scene first. And so in a situation where you see someone having a medical emergency, right, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that the police had already called for medics? It would also be reasonable to assume that if the patient was cuffed I'm and- I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna say objection non-responsive. Wait for the question and then answer the question that is asked. It's a yes or no question, ma'am. Is it reasonable to assume that if a patient is having a medical emergency and the police are present, that they have called for EMS? Your, call, your question is unclear because you don't know my job, so um, okay. can't answer. Sure. So let's, let's take this scene. Right, mm -hmm. May 25th, 2020, you walk upon a scene, you see someone having a medical emergency, right? You did not call 911 to get the medics there, right? Right. Would it have been reasonable to assume that medics had already been called based on what you saw when you first arrived? Yes. And in fact, paramedics did respond, right? You saw the ambulance come up. Yes, that's not their normal response time. Okay. 
And so you noticed there was some abnormal response time for medics. Right, and I also noticed that that is precisely the kind of call that fire would respond to and station 17 is just a couple blocks away. Okay, so do officers on scene decide, do we call for medic or fire? I don't believe so. I believe that's dispatch. I, they, so, they call for medical so if, if attention. So if police call dispatch and they say EMS, we need EMS code three, it's dispatch who decides, do we send medics or fire? Well, it would be medic, it would be fire with medics, not just fire ever. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Fair enough. But ultimately, medics did arrive, right? Um, yeah, eventually. And you have no frame of reference of when police called paramedics, do you? No, but I know how long it takes for medics to get to calls typically, and I know how long it takes to drive three blocks in an emergency fire vehicle. But pres that presumes that the fire vehicle was not on another call right it would have been a different station that was we would the nearest the nearest two other stations would have been able to respond to that call in three minutes right. so if you uh, first walked on scene at 8 26 29 that was what we just saw okay 8, 26 29 okay and paramedic and paramedic paramedics had been called at 821, that's an abnormal response time based on your experience. What time did you say I arrived? 826, 29. And, they, and the medics arrived at what time? The medics were called at 821, code three. I don't believe that. But again, you have no frame of reference, right? I mean, you've not seen any police reports. You've not looked at the CADs. You've not heard the 911 calls. You didn't listen to dispatch that night, did you? That night? No, not that night. Okay. But I, that's totally abnormal. All right. And fire would have been added to that call because we go to calls like that all the time. Right. And so it was abnormal. It would be completely and totally abnormal in your experience for it to take that long to get to the scene. Absolutely. All right. And um, are you familiar with the term load and go? Yes. And I believe you had a conversation with uh, the BCA agents shortly after this incident, and you described what you observed as far as the paramedics doing was what's called a load and go, right? Correct. And, the, and that is essentially, if I, as I understand it, paramedics arrive, Some something is a miss at the scene mm -hmm. so we put them into the ambulance and we move the ambulance to another a safe location to right. address the needs and that's what you observed here right correct and that's uh, because there were quite a few people and those people were all fairly upset right correct and so in your mind as a paramedic with the experience that EMT. you have, oh, I'm sorry as an EMT I apologize but as an EMT You've done load and goes before? We've done load and goes, yeah. Right. And so the reason that the medics did not commence, at least as far as you understood, commence resuscitative efforts for Mr. Floyd was because they were doing a load and go, get him away. Okay. Yeah. Well, Overall. That's what you told the agents, right? Uh, I don't remember exactly what I told the agents, but that would, it looked like a load and go to me. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, your, again, personal experience, mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me, on that day, you were, the, the paramedics drove off, and then at some other point, a couple minutes later is when the truck, the fire truck arrives, right? Right, and that's how I knew there was something wrong when requesting medical assistance. 
okay? Because the, the parent or the fire sh department showed up at Cup Foods and the ambulance had already left and gone to another location. No, more because the fire, fire whether it's 17s or a different station, would have been able to respond to that call much sooner than medics were. All right. So in a... I mean, you, you kind of formed that opinion on that day that there were some miscommunications between medics and fire and police. Um, right, which, I mean, not to the fault of medics or fire. It's we get a call and we go. Okay. So it was, it was police and dispatch that that miscommunication would have come in. Okay. Um, and again, that five or six minute delay is just unheard of in your experience. Uh, yes. Uh, not by medics, but by fire specifically. Are you trained uh, as an EMT in the use of Narcan? Yes, sir. And can you explain what Narcan generally is? Um, it's an opioid reversal uh, medication. Um, we give it intranasally, um, but a lot of people on the street have an um, injectable form. Kind of like an EpiPen almost, right? Yeah, kind of. Um, you testified that the firehouse that you work at uh, you deal with a lot of overdose calls. Correct. And um, so you've had a lot of experience dealing with people who are overdosing. Correct. From, from opiates or from other controlled substances. Correct. And you have seen, um, you have seen uh, or dealt with many people who come out of an opiate overdose because of Narcan. Correct. Um, if I if I didn't have Narcan though, we still give uh, if we'll monitor a pulse and give compressions as necessary. Um, I've never not had Narcan, but I would be able to give medical attention to somebody that had overdosed on an opioid and lost their a pulse. Okay, so let me ask you, um, is it fire department policy when you are going to a call of an overdose that police are also dispatched to that call? I believe so, yeah. And that is because when people are revived from that, they often become combative, right? Uh, not often. I'm sorry. Not often. But it happens. It, I've seen it happen. Now I'm gonna just kind of talk to you a little bit about um, your testimony about uh, May 25th of 2020. You were out for a walk, because it was your day off, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're out for a walk, and uh, you're walking down, you're walking westbound on 38th Street, and you see the lights, and you said it's not uncommon to see lights there. In my neighborhood, not yeah. not on that corner, but in my neighborhood. Okay. Um, or in the city. Right. Okay. And uh, as you walked what would be the southeast corner of 38th in Chicago, you talked to, you heard a woman say, yelling that they are killing him, right? Right. And so you did this kind of circle loop to visualize and see what was going on, right? right. And... Um, at the point that you came on scene, Mr. Floyd was already on the ground, right? Correct. And Mr. Floyd, um, you saw what you what your memory told you was four police officers on him, right? Correct. But you now know that it was three, right? Correct. And I think you made some reference about why you videotaped because our memories are fallible, Correct. right? And Again, a stressful situation can impact your memory, right? Absolutely. That's why we're lucky it was videotaped. Right. Is 
It's also fair to say that once you kind of came, you first talked to Officer Tao, and you said that you identified yourself as a Minneapolis firefighter, right? Correct. And Officer Tao asked you to step onto the curb, and you did that. Correct. Right? And you would agree that when you first arrived on scene, your own personal, I'm just talking about you personally, your own personal demeanor was much more calm. Correct. And as you were there between 826 and 830, so in about those four minutes, um, you would agree that your own demeanor got louder and more frustrated and upset. Um, frustrated, I'm not sure is the word I would use. Angry? More desperate. Okay. And you called the officers a bitch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got quite angry after Mr. Floyd was loaded into the ambulance and there was no point in trying to reason with them anymore because they had just killed somebody. So in terms of the, in terms of the time that you were there, you have no idea what those officers were doing on the side of the car, right? Say it, uh, the officers that I couldn't see from my vantage point, is that what you're asking? Right. Um, you right, don't know I what could, they were doing. I couldn't see the two junior officers, um, except for maybe like their shoulders up. And um, so it's fair to say you don't know what they were doing. Correct. You don't know what they were talking about. The two of them, no. And there was, a, a, again, you described a fairly large crowd, 10, 12 people that were all in that general area. Mm -hmm. And several people were yelling, right? Right. And some people were yelling louder than others, right? Right. And some, a lot of people were saying things like, get off of him, right? Right. And a lot of people, you yourself, were saying, I want to know what his pulse is. Yeah. Right? And some, some people were um, swearing. Absolutely. And would you describe other people's demeanors as upset or angry? Um, it's, it's, I, I don't know if you've seen anybody be killed, but it's upsetting. Uh, answer is yes, I was just going to object, Your Honor. As argumentative, and you can proceed. I'm going to just ask you to answer my questions as I ask them to you, okay? You also talked about how when you first approached, you saw the complete and total body weight of all three officers on Mr. Floyd. I never Anderson. said all three officers. I, I, their body weight was on him, the, the two in the back, their, their full body weight was seeming to be on him, but that's not something that would kill. All right. And the, but you, you testified that their okay, yes. body weight, yes, their body was, weight, yes, was on. Just answer his questions if okay. you would. Yeah. So, so, just to be clear for the record, is clear. You testified. Yes. Let me finish my question. Finish your question. You testified that when you first arrived, you observed the weight of all three officers on Mr. Floyd. Yes or no? Yes. But again, once you were ushered or commanded or directed, whatever term you want to use, to the curb, you again, as far as the other two officers, you were not watching who had their weight, where, or what. I could, correct, I could not see the other two officers. I could see them and they were not talking much. Okay. I could see their faces. A um, lot of people were yelling. Right. And again, you were not paying attention to what they were saying. Um, just here and there. Okay. So do you remember what the officers were talking about? Oh, the officers, no, I have no idea. Uh, they, they weren't talking. All right. You also testified that as you were observing uh, Mr. Chauvin on George Floyd, 
that you form the opinion that Mr. Chauvin's hand was in his pocket. Correct. And you described him as comfortable. Correct. You also testified that you observed what you thought to be fluid coming from Mr. Floyd's body and you assigned that or you believed that to be urine. I, I considered that, that it was and took that as a sign. Do you needed. recall telling the agents that it was his urine? I don't recall. And you said that you testified that your focus became really sort of zoomed in on trying to get the attention of the officers, right? Not the attention so much as um, trying to reason with them and gain access to get medical attention. Okay. And you testified that you believe that the other voices, the voices of other, other people interfered with you, you getting their attention. I was worried about it, but I know that Tao could hear me talking because he was responding to me directly. Now, in terms of your uh, the statement that you gave, you uh, were interviewed by agents Lund, Matthew Lund, and agents James Ryerson. Do you recall those names? No. Do you dispute me if I'm no. telling? Okay. And would you dispute me if I told you that that interview took place on May 28th of 2020? No. And before coming into court, did you have an opportunity to review your statement at all? Um, I had the opportunity to, but I didn't. Okay. Um, you never read the transcript of your statement or anything? I chose not to. Okay. Um, I just wanna just ask you a few questions. You, you said that Officer Tao at some point said, if you're really a firefighter, you should know better. Correct. Right? Um, have you been to other scenes where people are trying to interfere with police officers doing their jobs? No, not really. Not that I can recall. Do you remember telling the agents that you believed that Officer Chauvin had his hands in his pocket? Um, vaguely remember saying that. Do you recall telling the agents that you were pretty certain the fluid was coming from Mr. Floyd's body and that's what made you think he was dead? I'm sure I said that. Pretty, pretty sure. Do you recall describing the crowd as a heavy crowd? No, I don't recall. Would it refresh your recollection to review the transcript of your statement? Um, I don't want to. Okay. Would you dispute me if I told you that you told the agents it was a heavy crowd? I, no, I guess not. Do you recall after paramedics took Mr. Floyd and then you had a conversation with uh, the firefighters that arrived, that how you described the physical appearance of Mr. Floyd? I don't recall. Do you recall telling them that he... I don't want argument. What's your grounds? Sustain. You may impeach if you wish. All right. 
I know you don't want to look at your transcript, but I'm, may I approach the witness? Mm -hmm. Ms. Hanson, you may show up. Our counsel is page 82 to 85, page 11 of 20. I'm just going to ask you to read the underlying portions in your head. Yeah. Does that refresh your recollection of this conversation? Uh, yeah. Did you describe Mr. Floyd as a small, slim man? Overall. Yeah, it appeared to, uh, with three grown men on top of somebody, it appeared that he was small and frail. But I know that's I'm not gonna, to be there's true, no obviously. Question. There's no question. I was finishing my answer. Uh, please uh, go back into the courtroom. Counsel, remain. Witness, remain. Outside the hearing of the jury, Ms. Hansen, I'm advising you, do not argue with counsel, and specifically, do not argue with the court. Is I, the I camera will... off? Are the cameras off? No, they are not. We are on the record. Okay. You will not argue with the court. You will not argue with counsel. Mm -hmm. They have the right to ask questions. Your job is to answer them. I was finishing my answer. I will determine when your answer is done. Okay, well... And so, do not argue with the court. Do not argue with mm -hmm. counsel. Answer the questions. Do not volunteer information that is not requested. The attorneys for the state have redirect. They can ask you questions if they think that certain things were left out. Okay. It is counsel's prerogative to ask you leading questions and for you to answer those and not volunteer additional information. Okay. Are we clear on this? We're clear. Thank you. Come back tomorrow at 930. All right. Do we have the person with the cell phone? Could we arrange to have that person come down? Somebody from the state to have access to that person? If you could have that person come in. All right, so once again, we've been listening in live here to 